Hello, SYSK fam, it's Josh. And for this week's Stuff You Should Know Selects, I've chosen Bridges, Nature Abhors Them, which we released back in June of 2015. And it's a pretty good one. It's got a lot of engineering, believe it or not, but it's not like the eye glazy kind. It's like the, oh my God, this is amazingly fascinating kind. I hope you feel that way at least, and I'll bet you will. So enjoy Bridges, Nature Abhors Them. Starting now. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark with Charles W. Chuck Bryant with Jerry Rowland with me, Josh Clark. And this is Stuff You Should Know featuring Josh Clark. I was about to say, you never introduced yourself and then you done did it twice. Three three times. Uh, oh, yeah, you always introduce yourself. Yeah. But you never say your last name. I think that's what struck me. Hey, you're <laughs> Josh. No, I say I'm Josh Clark. Do you? Yeah, every time. I should listen to these sometime. Yeah. <laughs> that explains the glazed over look in your eyes whenever we start. Mm hmm. Um, bridges. Yeah. Is that your intro? Yep. <laughs> I like them. Maybe we can add like a scat drummer on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> we have that kind of um, when we're doing uh, listener mail. There's a little bit of... D- 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 oh, yeah. Well, that's not scat drumming. I would say that's more of a shuffle. Mm. Scat's like... <laughs> yeah. Like that? Yeah, you should get Hodgman to scat for you sometime. He's a good... Oh, I'll bet he's, he's good, good at, at scatting, it. <laughs> yeah. A lot of boop boop bidoos going on when, I, he, yeah, when he's scatting. Scat. Any jazz hands? No. no. It's not exactly Manhattan transfer level. Oh, he's intermediate? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so again, bridges. Ta-da. Yeah, you know, I bet we're going to hear from some folks because there are bridge enthusiasts. Yeah. Which I think is kind of neat. Yeah, well, I mean, they're like modern marvels of engineering. And actually, there's some ancient marvels of engineering, too, as far as bridges I was just about to go. say that, dude. They are... Um, yeah, they're you basically. Uh, I was talking to our pal um, Adam, the architect. Oh, the bridge builder. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's a building builder, or a building designer. Yeah. I don't know if he actually knows how to build the buildings. He just knows how to tell other people how to build. I <laughs> bet Adam can't swing a hammer. <laughs> so he was saying that um, uh, the. Um, Basically, the structural engineers who design bridges mm-hmm. are just straight up geniuses. Oh, I'm sure. Like it requires a, basically a genius to to factor in all of this stuff. Yeah, anyone can design a building. <laughs> you know, this is four walls and a bunch of floors. Right. Put a roof on it. A bridge though, is different. That's right. There aren't walls really. Um, there can be bridges of Madison County. They had walls. Oh yeah, they have walls. <laughs> uh-huh. I was going to mention the bridges of Madison County. Yeah, I love those. That'd be a beam bridge, I guess. Mm, yeah. With a uh, a truss, right? A top truss. What's the top truss called? A through truss. Yeah, through truss. And then below that, if it were below, it'd be a deck truss. But I don't know if that counts as a truss. It's more just like a house on top of the bridge. I bet there's structural support there. I guess. Maybe. I thought it was ma- mainly just to keep the rain off of you when you cross the bridge, like just an extra little thank you for crossing the bridge. I thought it was just to draw in lackey tourists mm. who uh, wanted to have their picture made. Another famous bridge, the one that the Headless Horseman couldn't cross in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Oh, yeah? Wasn't that a bridge? Sure. Trolls live under bridges? Bats. Draw bridges are pretty cool. Have yeah. you ever seen Maximum Overdrive, the beginning of that movie? Um, it's been many, many years. I, I saw, saw it, it again, in the 80s. I saw it again very recently, like this year. And it is, really? It's maybe better than it was before. It, it holds up as a crappy movie still? Yes. <laughs> yeah. The whole soundtrack is ACDC, by the way, which you should love. Uh, the whole soundtrack. I, I do love that, and I do remember that. And didn't Stephen King direct that? Yep. Which he doesn't do much, right? No. That may be his only one. It was definitely his first. Interesting. But there's a great drawbridge, drawbridge scene in there. Uh, I, did someone jump it, jump the span as it raised? N- no, I think their car fell in or their truck fell in. Oh, okay, because usually the drawbridge scene is like, I can make it. 
Uh, no, this one was you're all doomed. Yeah, you're kind not of making... <laughs> bridge scene. Gotcha. And uh, let me also recommend Budapest for bridges. You mean I went to oh. Budapest a couple of New Year's ago? Yeah, I went there like 20 years ago. Okay, so yeah, you know, yeah. the bridges are amazing. There, I think like five. Yeah, because they that, connect the two sides. Uh, yeah, Buda and Pest, mm-hmm. right? And each one is totally different. Like, it's just a completely different design. Yeah. And they're just all gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, let's just start with a bunch of bridge recommendations. I'm going to recommend <laughs> the city of Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. Uh, I went Very to a baseball game there, and it's just gorgeous. Those beautiful bridges that you can see from the baseball stadium mm-hmm. and the river. That was when we were Lovely. shooting a Toyota commercial That's thing, right? right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I stayed in the hotel and just ate um, sog paneer. No, chicken sog. Right. Just the, like a, a quart <laughs> of it. But you could see the baseball stadium out your hotel window. Yeah, and I saw some bridges too. Yeah, you walk across the bridge to get there. Right. Or at least we did. What else? Any other bridges? Meh. Oh, well, Brooklyn Bridge. Sure. Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. yeah. Those are like the famous ones. They're barely even worth mentioning. Yeah, but the Brooklyn Bridge is... For your money, it's uh, which is free. It's a pretty great thing to do to walk across it. It's go- it's just beautiful. I have never done that. Yeah, you should do it. Even the Geico lizard did it, and I haven't. <laughs> that guy's like Australian or something. Well, maybe we should just animate you and have you walk across it. Uh, one more thing: if you want to know more about the Brooklyn Bridge, I don't remember which one we talked about it in, but there is a really cool documentary about the Brooklyn Bridge and its building. Yeah, uh, by Ken Burns. Oh, wow. I believe it's on Netflix. I'll have to check that out then. Yep. Because I like Ken Burns and Brooklyn Bridges. Yep. All right. You ready? Uh, Yeah, man. So bridges have been around for a very long time. This article is by Robert Lamb and another dude named Michael Morrissey together. Yeah. I believe they were locked away in a closet for like a couple of months <laughs> while they worked this out together. Well, he the one of the first ones talking about ancient bridges that they mention in here, the uh, uh, Arcadico Bridge in ancient Greece. Mm-hmm. Did you see that thing? No. It's really neat. I mean, it, it still stands. It's a 3,000-year-old bridge, and uh, it's just kind of cool to think about, you know, ancient civilizations and ancient times. People said, well, I want to get over there, right? and I'm here. Yeah. And uh, so let's build something to do that. I need something to walk on. Yeah. Or drive my cart over. It's that simple. Um, I, I saw that the, I saw the world's oldest bridge that's still in use um, is in Turkey over the um, Milas River, I believe. Yeah. From 850 BCE. Do you know what that one's? Uh, how it's constructed? It is a single. Rock. It is a single stone slab arch. I believe. Uh, okay. No, it is a stone slab. Single arch. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Very basic. Yeah, but the arch, it's super old, Mm -hmm. but it's still in use today. Oh, yeah. Because whoever figured it out came upon this very elegant solution to a lot of problems that a bridge poses. Because as you were saying, when when you come upon like a river or a creek or something, you say, I'm on this side and I need to be on the other side, so I need something to walk across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's a basic solution, but the further and further you get, the more and more problems. Like, yeah. as bridge builders say, mo span, mo problems. <laughs> yeah, I guess what we should have said is, I want to walk across and live. I want to walk all the <laughs> right. way across. Uh, right, I don't want to fall down. No, I don't want to get halfway across and have it snap. Right, so over the years, as <clears throat> people have come upon problems where you are going to build a bridge that will snap and, and kill you, they've come up with solutions to prevent that from happening. Pretty That's pretty amazing. much the pursuit of bridge building, Yeah, is coming up with ways to prevent a bridge from collapsing. Yeah, and a lot of trial and error over the years. <laughs> yeah. You know? And a lot of real significant disasters. In fact, there's a Time Magazine slideshow um, called Worst Bridge Collapses in Past 100 Years. <laughs> Um, and it's got all these photos of collapsed bridges and little descriptions and the number yeah. of fatalities and everything. But um, it's it's really interesting. All these different bridges have collapsed and failed for all these different reasons. Well, and after each one, uh, it's very sad, of course, but after each one, someone goes, oh, well, we should do this for the next one. Right. We should not forget that bolt next time. Well, that's that could be human error, true. That's happened. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh. 
All right. So should we start off with the bats? <laughs> yeah. B A T S. Beams, arches, trusses, and suspensions are the main components, uh, of the structural components of a bridge. It's very simple. Boom. That's it. That's all you need to do <laughs> to construct your own bridge. And with these four things, you can make almost any kind of bridge. Um, we're going to cover mainly beam uh, bridges, arch bridges, truss bridges, suspension bridges, mm -hmm. and then the super cool looking cable stayed bridge. It is super cool looking. Probably my favorite looking bridge in the world that I came across in re researching this is a uh, cable stayed bridge, the one that's in the article. Oh yeah, they look like uh, they look like sails. It's gorgeous. The big triangles rising up. It's lovely. Yep. But it, they look a little more modern to me. They don't have that classic uh, architecture like the Brooklyn Bridge does, or like the Tower Bridge in London. Yeah, I think that's why I like it. Yeah, you like the modern look. Yeah, yeah. You're a modern guy. I'm super mod. <laughs> All right. Um, they point out in the article, which is very key, what you talked about: the span of the bridge. Mm -hmm is the distance between the supports, and that's where um, that's where it all goes down, basically. Yes. that's got to be strong there. Those are something that every single bridge has, is a span and at least one support. Mm -hmm. Most likely two. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. um, and there's different... The reason that there are different types of bridges is because different bridge designs, the, the BATS designs, what is it? beams, arches, trusses, and suspension, mm -hmm. they provide stability for varying span lengths. Yeah. So like a beam, if you have like a 50-foot um, span, just put a, a like a, a, a very long log over, <laughs> over the span, and there you go. There's your bridge. Yeah. But as you get further and further along, you have more and more problems supporting that span, so you need different types of solutions and the different length of the span calls usually for a specific type of bridge design. Yeah, and generally, it, it'll. I mean, there's a lot of overlap, of course, but um, beam bridges tend to be the shortest, followed by arch bridges and then suspension bridges. Right. And I think those, um, the uh, cable stayed bridge is is kind of a suspension bridge, so that counts. Yeah, right? it's like a kind of a variation. Yeah, but it's those related. Are, they to can it. be very long as well. Yeah. Yeah. Not quite as long as suspension bridges, though. From what I understand in this, um, the suspension bridge affords the longest span. Okay. So you got a, a big, long span, it's it's suspension time. Yeah, and they're also super expensive. Yes. Suspension bridges. Because all the bridge builders know that you got a long span that you're trying to cross. you probably got some deep pockets, and they're going to milk you for it. Oh, yeah. Every penny. Yeah. Yeah. Like you need a suspension bridge? I'm your guy. Yep. Um... All right, so let's talk about uh, there are a lot of different uh, forces that can act on a bridge to make it not as stable. Um, we'll cover a few of the, the other ones later, but the main two here early on are tension and compression. Yeah. And the very easy way to think about these two things is tension is like if you, if you and I are pulling a rope, mm -hmm. like you're on one end and I'm on the other, we're going to pull that sucker tight, and uh, I'm going to fall over due to your – Massive uh, strength. I'm pretty huge, but um, there will be some tension in that rope. Yeah, tension and maybe is, between us is, is <laughs> after you fall down. Yeah, and I'd start laughing. Yeah, there would be tension. Sure, but tension is the lengthening of something. Yes, compression is the shortening of something. Yeah, like a spring collapse. Right. So it's easy to visualize when you're talking like springs and ropes and that kind of thing. But if you're talking about just a single deck of a bridge, mm -hmm. which you think of as one piece. Um, it's tough to it, it starts to get tough to visualize it until you realize that you have to look at like a bridge deck, like yeah. the roadway on the bridge, yeah. as really having a top and a bottom. Yes, and forces well the compression acts in the downward motion on the top, and the tension acts from the underneath coming up on the bottom. Right, so right. the bottom of the bridge underneath it uh, of the deck is is going to be spread out under the force of tension, where on top, where the, it's being pushed down, compressed, that's compression. Yeah, and they kind of in a weird way work together, even though they're right. sort of opposite things. They're definitely related. Yeah. Right. Uh, and what will happen is if these, uh, if, if you aren't a very good bridge builder, um, buckling will occur when it's compressed uh, on the top. Yeah. And snapping can occur on the bottom uh, when tension is at work. That's right. 
It all sounds very confusing, but if you just, all you got to do is like put your hand out and look at it. Right. You know? And so, or if you take a... And push down on your hand or up <clears throat> on your hand. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like that. Yeah, like that. <laughs> um, the the whole thing becomes very, very evident when you look at a beam bridge, right? Yeah. The most basic form of a bridge. Like if you dropped a log over a river. Right. And this, this thing, um, this article uses the example of like taking a pair of milk crates and yeah. putting like a, a two by four across them, right? Sure. Let's do that. If you put like a bowling ball on a bowling ball stand so it doesn't roll around. Yeah, that'd be awkward. <laughs> on top of the, um, on top of, or right in the middle of your uh, two by four, which makes up your beam bridge deck, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to see that it bows. And what you're seeing is that on the top, it's being compressed. On the bottom, it's being um, tensed, tensed <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and what you've just done is add a load to that bridge. And there's two kinds of loads to start out with. There's a dead load, which is the weight of the bridge and all of its materials combined. Yeah. And then there's a live load, which is, say, like the cars and the people and the trains and everything that, that add the extra weight while they're moving across it and everything. Yeah. And as you add this extra load, first of all, the bridge is already dealing with its dead load. Yeah. It's got to hold that up. That's job number one for a bridge. Yeah, like if you had a 300-foot 2 by 4 and two milk crates, it's going to sag in the middle just naturally. Right, and it might even break. And there have been bridges that have been built that where the guy forgot to carry the one or whatever, yeah. and they couldn't stand up under their own weight, and wow. they collapsed from their own weight. They collapsed from the dead load. So job number one of a bridge is to support its own weight. Job number 1.1 mm-hmm. is to um, support all of the live load, the traffic that goes across it as well. That's right. Uh, and the two ways that you're going to do this to counteract tension and compression are dissipation and transference force. Yeah. Uh, or transforming the force. So with dissipation, you spread out uh, that force equally. You spread out over a wide area. And with transferring, um, you move the area of weakness to an area of strength. Right, which pretty simple. Yeah, they're kind of tough to distinguish sometimes. Yeah, you know what I mean. But for example, like uh, the best example of dissipation is the arch, which we'll talk about how that works in a second. Yeah. Um, but suspension bridges are best at transferring the um, the tension and compression forces. That's right. So if you're if you're talking about a beam bridge, that most basic kind, uh, the other thing they're going to do to make it stronger, of course, is use Back in the old days, you used wood, then later iron, uh-huh. and then steel, right. maybe some concrete mixed in. Yep. Um, but the size of the beam is going to be really important, like the height of the beam is important because the, the top is going to experience stress, the bottom is going to experience stress, and the middle, not as much. So a good I-beam, right. a good tall I-beam is what you want. Yeah, and I didn't realize that that's why I-beams are made like I-beams. I didn't until really just either. Now. It's it makes because perfect sense. The center of like the deck or the beam or whatever, uh-huh. any kind of beam, is going to experience the least amount of compression or tension. It's really the top or the bottom. Yeah. So you don't have to put quite as much material into the center of the beam as you do the top and the bottom to prevent buckling and snapping. That's right. So with the beam bridge, you're going to add what's called a truss. Uh, to make it stronger, this uh, we'll talk about trusses more, but it's basically a, a triangulated strength. And you'll see a truss if you've ever seen like a a train uh, uh, bridge, like you see a truss on top. Or th- like in areas where they get a lot of snow, roof supports will frequently be trusses. Yeah, and that's a through truss on top, we already said. And if it's underneath, then it is uh, the deck truss. Right. And you can have both, but usually, like, with the railroads, you'll see, like, that top truss. Uh, not the same as a trestle. That's different. Right. That's like uh, like a roller coaster, you know? <laughs> so after this break, why don't we talk more about uh, truss bridges? Nice. So, Chuck, no joke, trusses are one of my favorite things now. It's pretty neat. After doing some research into them, I'm like, I love trusses. You're a truss guy. Yeah, and Uh it's because they're so 
s- elegant and simple. Mm-hmm. They're elegantly simple, basically. Yeah. So um, I saw this really great explanation where – it was on Make Magazine, and I think it was called, like, uh, Ask Make, How Do Trusses Work? Pretty straightforward. Um, and it basically had, like, a, a really ga- a great graphic of taking po- using popsicle sticks, right? Okay. Let's say you make a square out of popsicle sticks, and you join the, the popsicle sticks together at the corners where the ends all meet. Yeah, a little Elmer's paste, maybe. Makes sense. Uh-huh. Seems pretty... Sp- supportive, right? Yeah. But when you press down on e- any one of those joints, which is where the load's going to be uh, centered mm-hmm. or distributed most, yeah. remember the ends? It, the, the square shifts to the side, and all of a sudden you have a rhombus. Well, a rhombus is inherently less structurally sound than a square, which yeah. is why you very rarely see rhombuses in architecture. Right. Right? With a triangle, when you press down at any one of the joints... It distributes that compression or tension directly through the center of the beam. Yeah. So the triangle stays totally rigid. And when you add the more triangles you add, the more support you have. So they're like basically like as far as a shape goes, the superconductor of transferring or distributing compression or tension. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. And that's why when you see that that train uh, trestle and that has that truss on top, it's Mm – Got all those beautiful diagonal uh, pieces of metal. Right. And it's not just for, for looks, even though it is cool looking. No. One of the other great things about a uh, truss is that they're, you know, it's like just a three steel beams or three whatever, aluminum beams. They're just three pieces of metal, usually, mm-hmm. fixed together. And that's that's the other key that I left out. They They have to be connected at the ends. Yeah. Equally distributed. From each end, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say you, you drill a hole to, to rivet one side of the truss to another, or one end of the truss to another end. The The other end has to be equally far away. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They wouldn't just be like, oh, just drill that other one wherever. So anyway, you have to, the the place where the truss sides join together has to be on the ends. Yeah. And then, but one of the things that it allows for is for wind to blow through it easily. Oh, sure. That's a huge point about trusses. Yeah. They're not solid in that they're, they don't, they don't pr- put up a lot of resistance to when they allow it to flow through, which is really kind of what you want. We'll see when you're building bridges. Yeah, I think even the, the covered bridges have, uh, it's more of a lattice type thing on the sides, right? Yes. It's, it's not solid, is it? That'd be dumb. A covered bridge? Yeah. Yeah, they're solid. I thought the walls were usually like a lattice, so wind could pass through. No, mm. and they had a they had a roof, and like a latticey uh, side. Is that right? Yeah, maybe there's all kinds. Yeah, I think those are just to keep the rain off. Oh yeah, that's what you said earlier. You keep shooting down the uh, <laughs> the theory of <laughs> the structure support. thing. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, trust is rock. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yes, there's your T-shirt. <laughs> trust is rock. So. Are we at arches? Uh, did we say that they frequently use trusses to support beam bridges? Yeah. Okay. Arches. Now, when we say a bridge is an arch bridge, the deck is not some uh, big hill that you drive over. The deck is flat. The arch is underneath. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And you can have a single arch if uh, your span isn't that long, or you can have a big one with like six or eight arches. Although I've seen, I think there are like short arch bridges that actually do go up and down. Oh, sure. You know, like if I mean, there's natural usually. arch bridges, like rock formations yeah. that are like that, and that's why they're still standing. There's, um, there's, there's a bridge that forms like a perfect circle. So, like when when you see it reflected in the water, it just looks like a, a circle. Oh, neato! Isn't that neat? Yeah. Arch bridges are pretty cool too. There are no trusses. But they're beautiful in their own way. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so the arch is obviously semicircular, um, and like you said, if it meets the water and reflects nicely, fully circular. Fully circular, uh, and the entire uh, form is going to divert weight onto what are called abutments, and this is what takes on the pressure. It's like, uh, I mean, if it's just a single arch, those abutments are probably going to be part of the earth, uh, right? On yeah. one side or the other. Yeah. Um, and the whole point of an abutment is when you press down on an arch or when, you know, gravity pushes down on it or it's compressed, 
that force goes downward and it makes the sides of the arch go out. Yeah. Those abutments press inward so that the force of compression just goes straight down through the arch circle, the semicircle, yeah. and into the earth or into the ground or whatever. Yeah, and, and it's uh, the arch, The what I thought was interesting, it's really all about fighting that compression. There isn't a lot of tension right. that comes into play with an arch bridge. I think the tension is grows more and more possible when the um, degree of the arc or arch grows. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that could come into play? It can, but for the most part, when you're building an arch, you have to worry about compression more than tension. Gotcha. Yeah. So there's uh, stylistically and artistically, design-wise, there are all kinds of arches, uh, Baroque arches, Renaissance arches, uh, Roman arches. They were the Romans built, you know, arch bridges that are still standing today. Yeah. Have you, um, have you been to Rome? Yeah. Man, it's just like you're walking along and... All of a sudden, you look to your left, and there's like a 2,000-year-old aqueduct. Yeah. You know, 1,500-year-old arch just sitting there. Yeah. I remember the first time I went to Europe coming back and being sort of like bummed out. Yeah. You know, because we're walking along, and there's Burger King. Right. (laughs) You know? Yeah. This house is 200 years old. Right. You should go to Rome. I know. My house is like 80 years old, and it seems super old. Yeah. Nothing. Not Um, by Roman standards. No. But, you know, a little drafty in those uh, thousand-year-old apartments. Yeah, but it's so neat, though, because, I mean, like, there's so much old surviving stuff yeah. that not all of it's even meant to be preserved. Some of it's just, like, just there. It's not yeah. like a part of a park or an historic exhibit. It's just part of the city. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I've heard uh, co- other tourists complaining about how dirty Rome is and— I'm always just like, come on. It's like <laughs> You're focusing on the wrong part. It's been around for a long time. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, and also, yeah, <laughs> don't be stupid and just look around you. <laughs> like they're complaining in front of a 2,000-year-old fountain. I didn't notice it was particularly dirty. I mean, it wasn't any more dirty than like New York or anything. Yeah, any other big city. I yeah. agree. But the, uh, the thing with the arch, though, it, very stable once you get it built. But uh, the building process oh, yeah. is tricky because until you connect those two ends, um, that's what gives it its strength. So until that happens, it's a little dicey. Yeah, oh, yeah. Got to have some scaffolding going <laughs> on. Of, yeah, and, and they used to build wood scaf- scaffolds and supports yeah. to hold the thing, and then you just would build it in. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Now they use suspension cables. Like uh, I think the biggest arch bridge on the planet is West Virginia's New River Gorge Bridge. Man, that thing is unbelievable. It really is. And what's cool is when you look at it, um, it just it uses the cliff walls or the walls of yeah. the gorge as the abutments. Mm-hmm. Beautiful stuff. Super strong. And that's where uh, uh, we're, we, we're going to talk about that in our base jumping episode. I know. That's the fact that ties these two podcasts yeah, together. That's where they have bridge day. Talk about elegantly simple. So, suspension bridges, for my money, are where it's at. I, I think they deserve their own um, episode. Oh, yeah? Pretty, I mean, pretty much. They're, they're that complex. Like, this is just the briefest overview of bridges in general, but it, especially with suspension bridges, it feels like there's just so much going on with those things. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Kim Burns did like an eight-hour-long documentary on the Brooklyn Bridge alone. Yeah, that's true. He's a deep diver. He really is. We're over of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> With a giant helmet to go over his giant haircut. <laughs> he does have pretty big hair, doesn't he? <laughs> um, all right. So suspension bridges, we mentioned, of course, uh, Golden Gate Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge. This is when you have your deck, uh, your roadway is suspended by cables. Yep. Uh, between, can be a number of them, but uh, two, at least two tall towers. Right. That are supporting all of this weight. And uh, compression is pushing down, uh, traveling up through those cables, and is transferring all that compression through all those lovely cables. Right. So, I mean, another way to look at it is exactly what it sounds like. It's the bridge is suspended from cables, right? Yeah. But if you really start looking into what it's doing, it's not just holding these things up. What's what's going on is there's a transfer of that natural compression of the deck yeah. up through the lines, up through the cables, up down, up to the towers, which, like you said, send them down to the earth, yeah. right? So the the towers that hold the bridge up are at the same time 
distributing or dissipating the forces of compression that are trying to pull the bridge down into the water below it. Yes. And the tension you also have to deal with as well, and apparently you deal with that using another part of the structure of suspension bridges, which are called anchorages. Yeah, now that's just what the tower's connected to at the base, right? No? No, uh uh-uh. So it's like... um, Oh, the anchorages is like the abutment, essentially. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They're On the like, left and right. They're like a suspension bridge's abutments, whereas okay. as you get f- closer to the middle of the bridges, that's where the towers are. Yeah, yeah. But on the very ends, like say where the roadway hits the bridge, mm-hmm. you're going to have a massive piece of rock or massive piece of concrete, and those are the um, anchorages, and you have horizontal cables that distribute the compression from the bottom of the bridge to the um, the anchorages, and those those transfer those into the earth. Yeah, and you might also, depending on the size of your suspension bridge, have to have that below uh, deck truss as well to help stiffen the deck. Um, and, you know, if you have a 4,000-foot bridge, uh-huh. you're going to have all, all kinds of uh, trusses and decks and cables. And I think I finally figured out what it is about bridges that I love is what? that the the, archi- the the structural design that it needs to be strong mm-hmm. also happens to be beautiful. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like the way the cables are arranged, it's not like they're like, oh, this looks great. It's like, well, it has to be like this. Right. But it also happens to be very striking. Like Grace Jones. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so suspension bridges are your favorite, huh? I like them because uh, yeah. they have so much going on. Yeah. I like trusses because they're so elegantly simple, mm-hmm. and they're just tough as nails. There's a bridge for everyone, I think. There really is. Um, the cable stayed bridge, uh, and we should say that suspension bridges, when you think of a suspension bridge, you probably, probably think of the Golden Gate Bridge or something like that, right? Yeah. Just a classic suspension bridge. Two towers, two um, anchorages, lots of suspension cables. It's a suspension bridge. Mm-hmm. And you think, well, then they're probably pretty new. Wrong. Suspension bridges have been found in various forms for hundreds of years at least. And apparently the Inca were um, masters at building rope suspension bridges out of woven grass. Crazy, man. Yeah. 1500s, they discovered the Spanish conquistadors stumbled upon these. were like, what in the world is going on here? Right. Because the, the smart Europeans... Didn't figure this out for another, like, few hundred years after that. That's right. Um, the the Inca still have one of these bridges intact. It's a, it spans 90 feet, um, and they remake it every year as part of a three-day festival. So, oh, really? Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, which is why it's still intact. Because <laughs> a grass, woven grass oh, sure. rope bridge doesn't last all that long necessarily, even no. though wh- when it's fresh and new, it's strong. Yeah. As an expiration date. Right. What you're saying. But, but apparently, as we'll learn, all bridges have an expiration date. Ooh. All right. Well, we'll take a break then with that tease and talk about uh, the Cable Stayed Bridge and then um, how you might die on a bridge one day. All right, so we're on to your favorite, my friend, the super sleek, modern-looking cable stayed bridge, which is actually, actually, mm-hmm. actually, uh, has been around since uh, like World War II. Uh, yeah, but the idea, which came, is still modern, the idea came from a dude named um, Faust Vranchik. Yeah, man, and he was a contemporary of Kepler and Brahe, um, and he basically came up with the first design for a cable stayed bridge back in the 16th century. So what what's the nuts and bolts of this thing? So basically it is a rather than two towers mm-hmm. uh, like a suspension bridge uses, a cable stayed bridge uses one tower. Well, not always. Um, There's plenty of them that have more than one, but okay, but for a particular span of bridge. Yeah. There's one tower supporting okay, gotcha. that one span, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's basically, you, you can't use it for as long of a span as a suspension bridge. Right. But if you have a slightly shorter span and you don't want to spend quite as much money and you don't want as many wires up there and everything, you can go with a cable stay bridge. So you have one, usually one um, tower mm-hmm. holding up all of the cables. And the cables can either all connect to one point 
which is called a um, radial pattern. Yeah. Right? So it's like all these different cables are connecting on the bridge deck at different points. Yeah. But they're all connecting at about a single point on the tower. Again, architecturally lovely. Very neat looking. Yeah. And then another way that you can do it is um, in a parallel pattern. So they're connected at different points on the deck and they connect at different points on the um, tower. And that's the case with the Erasmus Bridge, which I think is the most beautiful bridge in the world. It's yeah. in Holland. Oh, wow. Wow, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, look at that thing. Look at that. Pow. Oh, yeah. That's something else. Yeah. I wish you guys could see this. That, well, they can look it up. It doesn't look like uh, very Dutch, though. No. It looks very... Um, it's like the New Holland, I guess. Yeah, New Amsterdam. I'm just picturing like Holland, I think of, uh, you know wooden windmills <laughs> oh and like tulips and stuff like that <laughs> yeah sure yeah. yeah this is modern holland for it sure. it looks like something that would be in like sydney australia yeah. well they have great bridge too they do mm -hmm. maybe that's where i'm thinking um living but, bridge well are you, are you done with those you well no, i was going to say another design for cable stay bridge looks a lot like a sailboat yeah with um the the tower standing straight up and then on each side cables going down at a diagonal from it to make it look like a, a sailboat sail Right. And mast. And again, for structural integrity more than anything. Right. Um, living bridges? Hmm? Sure. Uh, well, I guess we should say cable stayed bridges are, uh, they can't be as long as suspension bridges, but they can be pretty right. long. Yeah. Like up to close to 3,000 feet. But that's what I'm saying. Like if you have a, a shorter span and you don't want to use as many materials and hence yeah. spend as much money, a cable stayed bridge is a great alternative. Yeah. I wonder when cities... Uh, I wonder what the considerations are. Um, like I, money, what you... I would guess money first and foremost. Money, what you probably is best for the, the land. and But I also bet uh, that uh, architecture comes into play, like how it looks in the cityscape, don't you think? Yeah. Like uh, usually a city will have some sort of... Well, except several designs, mm -hmm. com competing designs. And then probably, well, like in Atlanta's case with the 17th Street Bridge goes with the cheapest one, right. and then half of it falls down onto traffic later, like a couple of years later. Did that happen? Yeah. Uh, when? Um, like two two years ago. Really? Yeah, man, it was a big deal. I Luckily, it happened at like four in the morning or five in the morning, but like when you're walking on the bridge, mm -hmm. you know the side stuff? Yeah. One whole side fell over onto 75 oh, yeah. below, onto the, onto the connector right below it. Yeah, I kind of remember that. Yeah. But it's an ugly bridge to begin with, really. Yeah. And dude, if you're listening, the guy who designed it, I'm sorry, I don't mean to insult your work, but I, I, do, I do, but do better. <laughs> I, it just the city could have done better, I think. Yeah, but I, I, I think what it came down to, I'm sure, was all of these are beautiful, but uh, we're just gonna spend the money on this one, right? You know, or whoever got the biggest kickback, <laughs> yeah, or wherever that came from. Not, not to be cynical. Living bridges? <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that. Um, if you go to northern India to the, here we go, uh, the uh, Meghalaya region. I think that was good. All right, close enough. Um, they have something pretty remarkable, and they are called living bridges. And what they did was it's so rainy there that all of their natural bridges were having a hard time staying intact because of all the moisture yeah, for monsoon season. Yeah, and that's, you know, you can't have a, a natural bridge with that much water. So they said, why don't we take these tree roots and grow them out of the ground and span a river over the course of years and years and years right. and then basically plant it on the other side into the ground, and this is now a natural tree root bridge. Right, it's like giant living bonsai like you're they were training roots yeah. to go a certain way and they they would take a um a tree a felled tree and split it in half and use that as the guide yeah right it's like the structure so it's sure. like they were building an arch but they weren't making an arch like sort of a temporary bridge exactly and they let the roots grow along that and like they they would plan these things out or they do plan these things out over the course of like a decade yeah and i i get the impression it's um, the whole town's responsibility, or at least some people in the town's responsibility to make sure that if you see your root starting to go down in the wrong place, you just right. pluck it up and <laughs> put it back on that felled log that's guiding it across the, the way. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Like, it requires patience, obviously, but it also, um, I imagine just once a day someone walks down and is like, 
yep, looking good. Yeah. And then just walks away again. Pets the bridge, says... Keep growing. I'll walk across you in 10 <laughs> years, buddy. And apparently those things can last up to 50 years, or the, the largest one that they have uh, up to 100 feet, which is 30 meters for our friends in India. Crazy. Um, and it can bear the weight of 50 people. And lasts up to 500 years, not 50. That's what I said. Oh, I thought you said 50. I said 50 people. Oh. Well, it's crazy. Like, you, you got to Google these things. Yeah, they're, they're very pretty. Very pretty. It looks very um, dark crystal y. Oh, yeah, totally. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. But it, they're not unsettling at all. No. Like the dark crystal. Right. Which, by the way, if you're ever in Atlanta, sometimes people say, hey, I'm coming to Atlanta. Yeah. What should I do? Uh, go to the Center for Puppetry Arts. Agreed. And just look at their free exhibit, yeah. which includes a full size Skeksy. It's terrifying. Yeah, they have all, we've talked about this before. They have uh, Emmett Otter. Oh, yeah, that's well. right. Yep. For me, that was pretty pretty magnificent. Oh, it meant a lot for Emmett Otter to meet you, too. Um, they're doing, actually, I saw I was just at the Museum of the Moving Image in Queens. Oh, yeah, I saw you post something about that. Yeah, they have a Mad Men exhibit right now, which is pretty neat. But, oh, but um, it was pretty cool. They, I was not there in time for the Jim Henson one. They're, they're putting that in place, I think, for later. Oh, it's coming? It's coming. Well, it's good. You didn't miss it yet. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll just go back. We went to the uh, Yoko Ono exhibit at uh, MoMA. Uh huh. Awesome. She's something else, dude. She's got a pretty cool mind. Yeah. She had, That's... she had this one display, and it was titled Three Spoons," and it was just four spoons in a row. It wasn't three. No. <laughs> <laughs> I love that stuff. Yeah. So I I recommend that as well. I'm not a fan of her music though. I actually got turned on to her music in the listening room there. Yeah. Plastic Ono Band. It's crazy, It man. is weird stuff, but I kind of like it. I mean, she's definitely one of the, the most, like, original thinkers, mm -hmm. you know, out there. And she's been at it for a while. Like, a lot of the stuff went back to the 60s, like the early 60s. Yeah, and talk know? about weathering criticism and still just being like, screw you. Yeah. I'm Yoko Ono. I don't yeah. care what you say. Well, she was exonerated too recently. Remember Paul McCartney came oh, out yeah. and said like, it was not Yoko Ono that broke up the Beatles, no, so well, stop saying that. It just were... took him like 50 years to come out and say it. Yeah. You know? She's like, would it kill you? Right. <laughs> You've told me privately many times, but right. a little press release. Just tweet it. <laughs> All right. So we talked about compression and uh, tension being the two main forces uh, there are quite a few other forces, dozens even, that can act on a bridge in a negative way. And the scariest one, for my money, is torsion. Um, if you've ever seen the video, it's a very famous video, mm -hmm. of the uh, bridge. What is it? The Tacoma? The Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Tacoma Narrows Bridge, when it looks like a, a, a wet noodle twisting in the wind. Yeah, it was 1940. It, it's nuts. And they have like footage of this whole thing just undergoing this destruction that kept just going on and on and on and finally the bridge just comes down yeah the craziest part is when you're watching it you just think oh man look at that thing it's nuts and thank god there's no one on it and then you see like a dude walking on it in a car yeah and a guy ran there was a dog there's one car in there and there's a dog trapped in the car and some, some guy ran and got the dog oh he did yes pretty great heroic stuff sure then later on i don't know if it was the same guy and another guy or just two completely new guys they're just walking along it. And this is after a whole section has fallen into the river, yeah. but the section they're walking on is still swaying. Are they it's just like, like this get is away neat. from the bridge. <laughs> Step back from the bridge, man. So that's torsion at work. Yeah, and that's a big problem that um, designers of suspension bridges face because you have a deck that's being held from – it's being held aloft by cables, mm -hmm. right? It's not like fixed to anything below it necessarily. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's being suspended. Sure. So, just like on like a rope bridge or something like that, it sways very easily, right? Yeah, those towers are strong, but it's not, you know, directly connected to those towers. Right. So, if you have a swaying bridge in between them, mm -hmm. right, it, and the thing is swaying back and forth, but if one side starts to sway over the other side, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you have an opposing circular force, and that's torsion. And that can basically rip the bridge in in two, which is sheer. Yeah, well, that's the other awful thing that can happen. It can just snap. Well, not snap, I guess, but just break into two parts. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, snapping is the result of compression. Yeah. So shearing would be what it's called technically. Yeah, exactly. Where two the the same span of bridge has the two opposing forces acting on it at once um, in opposite directions, and it goes. Whoosh, it makes that terrible sound. Um, if you want to combat torsion, um, many ways to do this. You're you're probably going to have a deck truss going on. Yeah. Uh, to help out, truss um, saves the day. Deck truss saves the day. You're going to have uh, you're going to do uh, wind tunnel tests if it's a modern bridge mm-hmm. beforehand. Well, you're going to make a model. Yeah, and, and do tests and see like how does wind affect this bridge and what do we need to do. But the thing is. With the um, with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in particular, they did tests. They had that thing rated at withstanding winds of up to 120 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. But the winds that day that brought it down were only 40 miles an hour. And for a long time, they were like, what happened? And somebody said, you know what it was? It was mechanical resonance. It was, yeah, the the, the deck truss was not sufficient for the span. That was part of it. And the way that the wind hit it right. and the angle caused the final thing, like you just mentioned, resonance, which is um, sort of, it's a vibration basically that gets out of hand. So resonance to me, I think, deserves its own podcast too. Yeah. It's awesome. Everything, every, especially anything that we build from an airplane to a bridge to a watch, ha- it, it, it has a certain frequency mm-hmm. um, where it will really pick up force, really absorb force. It'll run through it, right? So let's say that your bridge um, has a resonance uh, that's like at a frequency of 10. Yeah. That's probably a totally ridiculous number that I just said. But let's say it's 10, (laughs) right? And then let's say that wind comes at it at 40 miles an hour at just the right angle and it makes it sway Mm -hmm. at a frequency of 9, Well, that bridge is going to be, it's just going to sit there and sway. Not a big problem. If that wind hits it at just the right angle, at just the right speed, and it starts swaying at 11, it's still not quite a problem. Yeah. But if it gets it just right and it starts swaying at 10, all of a sudden those sways are going to become more and more pronounced because all that energy is flowing through at its maximum potential, at, at, at its freest flow, because it's hitting the bridge at its natural resonance, right? Yeah. And that's what caused the Tacoma Narrows Bridge to, to come down. Because once that thing starts going, there's no coming back from it. Oh, yeah. Well, you can it's see it a, happening. It gets worse and worse. Exactly. And that's that's because it hit it at just the right frequency. Yeah, they liken it in the article, which I think is pretty uh, down to earth, of a snowball rolling downhill. Exactly. It just keeps getting worse and worse, and yeah. you, you can't stop it. So, But isn't that bizarre that you, a bridge has a natural resonance, a natural frequency? I don't think so. I, I like, I would assume it would vibrate. Yeah, it, it did not occur to me at all. And I was talking to Adam about this too, and I was like, so I saw that building designers, bridge designers, they will fine tune mm-hmm. like a structure so that it resonates at a frequency that it, it's probably never going to encounter from an earthquake or from winds or whatever. Yeah, and I'm like, how do you do that? And apparently it comes down to the building materials you use, the shapes you use to yeah. form the structure, the, the way you join those shapes together. And you can basically say, I'm giving this building a frequency of 1.5. Right. Whereas I know all of the wind in the area and the ground movement from a an earthquake is going to make it vibrate at a frequency of seven. So it'll be fine. Yeah. And uh, one way, like you said, they can do that is by not having like one, like shortening the sections right. of the deck, let's say. Yeah. And uh, that way the vibration, when you have these overlapping plates and smaller sections... Uh, it's going to create enough friction to disrupt that frequency. Right. It'll change the frequency that the bridge yeah. is moving at. But, I mean, and not just bridges, too. You have to take this in, take into account, like, airplanes, right? Sure. You, you can't use engines on airplanes that create vibrations at a frequency that's at the nat- natural resonance of the airplane body. Yeah. Or else the airplane body is going to come apart just from turning the engines on. Yeah. Could you imagine seeing the airplane wings starting to flap? Like harder and harder, right? But apparently, the 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 more common thing when you have a disaster, a catastrophe from a resonance, a mechanical resonance problem, um, it's like one bolt is like I can't take it anymore yeah. and stops, and then that leads to a, a cascade of failures that ultimately has the bridge coming down. Yeah. 
interesting. I think that's fascinating. I had no idea that you had to worry about frequencies and vibrations. I mean, well, maybe I get, that's like, why all the bridges you've built have collapsed. They collapse pretty easy. <laughs> well, if you've ever heard the old... Uh, they go down like a French boxer. <laughs> I don't either. Um, but it was a Glass Joe reference. Remember him from uh-uh. Mike Tyson's Punch Out? Oh no! The was first that one guy of the guys? you encounter? He, he says he he was French. Glass Joe. Oh, gotcha. Instead of Glass Jaw, and he went down just like a sack of potatoes. So easy, man. Well, which was it? A sack of potatoes or a French boxer? <laughs> <laughs> he he was both. He went down like a sack of French potatoes. Yes, French fries. Right. My bridges go down like a French boxer, but Glass Joe, the French boxer, went down like a sack of potatoes. Gotcha. Ergo, my bridges go down like a sack of potatoes. Um, if you've ever heard the old wives' tale that, like, an army marching across a bridge in step can cause enough vibration to take down that bridge. Yeah. It's true. That could happen. Yep. So if in they, if wartime, they do it at the right frequency, right? Yeah, in wartime, that's they will break step. In other words, their rhythm isn't all the same to avoid that uh, scenario. And there was a bridge disaster I saw in that Time magazine slideshow where that happened. Um, there were there were a pair of Skywalk bridges inside the Hyatt Regency Kansas City hotel mm-hmm. um, in the lobby. They were just like you know raised bridges sure. going through the lobby, and they collapsed. In 1981, and killed like a bunch of people like, because like of 30 something people. People marching, dancing. Oh, they were dancing on the on the skywalk. And you think like up to today or yesterday when I started researching this, right? Like I just thought that's weight or pressure or something. Like if everybody's dancing, it didn't. It never occurred to me that the rhythm had something to do. Oh, really? See, yeah. I, I'd always heard that. Well, you are far more advanced than I am in structural <laughs> engineering, my friend. Not that. It's just I always heard that, like, you know, even a bunch of kittens walking across could cause that. And the, the reason they said kittens, of course, is so it has nothing to do with weight. Right, because kittens don't weigh nothing. And consequently, I think Lionel Richie had to change the name of that song because of the accident. I think originally it was, Hello? Oh, what a feeling when you're dancing on the skywalk. <laughs> and he had to change it to ceiling, and everyone was like, that's weird. You yeah. can't dance on a ceiling, but yeah. it rhymes. And he's like, yeah, but nobody ever died from dancing <laughs> on, the ski- on the ceiling. Uh, I guess the final thing we should mention is that weather um, obviously will play a big impact. We already talked about wind, but um, mm. over the years, the, the materials they use and the design has uh, gone in to take account things like wind and... Uh, what sun damage? I don't know what. I else. think uh, the freeze thaw cycle is huge. Yeah, I salt. Guess, sure, salt exposure. If it's going over like a salty body of water. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there's a a lot of things that are Ice. trying to bring a bridge down. Nature abhors a bridge, basically, as much as a vacuum. Um, I've got one. What you got? There's probably around six hundred and thirty thousand bridges in the U.S. alone. Because there were 617,935 in a 2002 census. And they add them, they were adding them at about 1,000 a year, maybe 900 a year. Wow. That's just the U.S. The world's longest bridge completed in 2010, the Danyang Kunshan Bridge. I think I've seen pictures of that. It serves as a railway bridge for the Beijing and Shanghai Railway. It's a 102 mile long bridge. That's nutty. Over water. I'm a big fan of the, of cities with uh, multiple water bridges. Sure. Well, that's why you liked Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, Portland, uh, Budapest. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Atlanta does. You know, we have bridges, but it's not like uh, you have to go to the the Chattahoochee River, or to yeah, the lakes. We, nobody goes to the Chattahoochee, you know. <laughs> what? Sure. Um, I got one more thing. I want to shout out to PBS's Build It Big website, yeah, which is like beyond 90s as far as websites go. But it was extremely helpful in understanding the forces that work on bridges, different types of bridges, different specific bridges. Yeah. Great website. And thanks to Adam, I guess. You got some information from him. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Was he into talking to you about it or was he... On the other end, going, oh my God, Josh, shut up! I'm watching Tim and Eric. He was, uh, <laughs> he was into talking about it. I figured he would be. Yeah, uh, and I, I actually have to shout out to Yumi too because I told her we were building bridge, or well, we were talking about bridges. She sent me a bunch of stuff on popsicle bridges. Oh. Um, apparently, there's a a Indiegogo mm-hmm. for the world's strongest or Canada's strongest 
popsicle bridge. Wow. Yeah. They're trying to build that? Yes. For And they have like six, six grand already. Man. For out of popsicle sticks. <laughs> Good for them. So that's everybody getting shouted out to all over the place in this one, huh? Yeah. That's nice stuff. Bam. If you want to know more about bridges, you can type that word into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. And since I said search bar, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this. I get a couple of street gang responses we'll read over the next couple of shows. Okay. Um, Here is one. I had to write in about your street gangs episode as it was interesting and pertains to my job. Short version is that I work for a hospital-based program and we see every gunshot wound victim and stab wound victim who comes through, Mm. uh, which is about four to five hundred a year, um, and about ten percent of those are gang involved. Uh, You guys have mentioned how you found the number of gangs to be hard to believe, but I think you may be thinking the street gangs is one entity that has strict borders and lots of people. Uh, In my experience, larger gangs will sometimes incorporate smaller gangs, and sometimes larger gangs will split off into many, many smaller groups. Uh, People go in and out of gangs and are sometimes affiliated with more than one. Currently, we have about at least 70 in our city alone, uh, and a substantial amount of those have less than 20 members. So they're like mini gangs. Gotcha. Not Uh, super gangs. Not super gangs. According to this paper on street gangs in Boston, 18% of the gangs in the city have less than 10 members. And 34% have 10 to 19 members. So uh, while the numbers you uh, gave seem shockingly high, they also seem to be in step with the current climate. And that is from Ariana. In what city did she say? You know, I don't see that. I don't think she said. (laughs) I don't know if it was Boston or if she just referenced Boston. Well, thanks a lot, Ariana. We appreciate that uh, email. And yeah, keep them coming. We want to know more about gangs. I just had the impression the whole time that like, one way or another, we were officially or unofficially misinformed. We may be. Uh, and also, let us know who's the coolest famous person you've ever met. Uh, you can <laughs> tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can put it in an email to stuffpodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. <laughs> Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.